now. Great. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Raquel. Okay, so now, without further ado, um, let me let, let, let you know that Quiet Communities is going to give an overview of the problem of leaded aviation fuel, its impacts, the environmental inequities, and Quiet Communities activities to date to help accelerate the transition to lead-free skies. And from Quiet Communities, we have Dr. Jamie Banks. She is the founder and president of Quiet Communities. She's a healthcare and environmental scientist with a background in health economics um, health Outcomes and Economics, Environmental Behavior and Policy, and she's also the chair of APH Noise and Health Committee. Um, welcome. And with her, we have her colleague, Becky Petro oruk She's a research assistant at Quiet Communities, and she has a degree from Boston University in Earth and Environmental Science with a chemistry minor. Becky does a lot of things, uh, including the problem, including working on the problem of leaded aviation fuel and specializes in data analysis and visualization. So Quiet Communities will set the stage for us. And then we have two colleagues from Earth Justice here as well. Um, they'll talk about the long history of this problem, the historic efforts that Earth Justice and others um, have um, done to help get the EPA to act, their current advocacy efforts, where things stand today, and the importance of raising awareness and support in our public health community. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce Kelly Lester, who's an associate attorney with the Toxic Exposure and Health Program at Earth Justice, and she works to eliminate exposures to hazardous chemicals through litigation and administrative advocacy. Um, Kelly is joined by her colleague, Nathan Park, who is an environmental advocate and associate legislative representative in the policy and legislative department at Earth Justice, covering lead exposure and national ambient air quality standards. So welcome, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Jamie, uh, and you can flow through the presentations and we'll have time for some Q&A um, after the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Kyra, and thank you, um, Raquel, for stepping in for Natalie. Um, we're really happy to be here, and I think that uh, what you just said about Earth Justice's work on this issue is a, is a great segue, because even though there have been decades worth of work, we came to this in a kind of uh, backdoor kind of way. Quiet communities, as you can imagine, really works primarily on noise issues from all different sources, and um, but also related pollution. And so one of our programs is our Quiet American Skies program, with, which deals with aviation noise. And it's through that program that we became aware that small planes still use leaded fuel and that the lead um, in that fuel was emitted as exhaust around general aviation airports and posed a threat to families living um, in close proximity to those airports. So we really decided this was just too important uh, to let go. We started looking into it and um, worked with uh, Rick Reebstein's class at BU. And I'm happy to say Rick was able to join us for about a half hour today. Um, Rick leads a class on, uh, it's like a work study class. So students help environmental organizations with various projects. And so Becky was one of the students that worked with us, was the student that worked with us on this issue. And what we did was we held a conference called Accelerating the Transition to Lead-Free Skies in December of 2022 to see, is there a way to do this more quickly than what the existing organizations and agencies were saying um, because of its importance for, for public health and for worker health. Um, Becky's going to be doing the presentation today, and I'm really pleased uh, to introduce her. She's a new member of the American Public Health Association, and she is the newest member of the Noise and Health Committee. So with that, um, Becky, I'll let you start. Thank you so much, Jamie. I'm gonna go ahead and share the slides. 
So our presentation today will be on lead emissions from aircraft, which is a lesser known source of lead exposure. The first part of the presentation will go over the extent of the problem and the health implications, and then I'll hand it over to Earth Justice, who will go over the legal and regulatory aspects. So lead being a toxin is nothing new. We all know that, and it's been known for a long time. We know that any exposure to lead is unsafe is unsafe and no blood lead level has been found to be safe for children. This is why it has been largely regulated by the EPA. EPA began in 1973 under the Clean Air Act to regulate lead emissions. By 1996, there was a phase out of leaded gas used for things like cars, trucks, and commercial planes, but there are exceptions to this. One of them being aircraft, specifically piston engine aircraft, also racing cars, farm equipment, and marine engines. And the contribution from piston engine aircraft is significant. 429 tons of lead is emitted to the atmosphere each year, about 69% of all the lead emitted total to the atmosphere. So just a little bit more about these planes, piston engine aircraft, they're not the aircraft you know, a typical person would use to get from point A to point B. The most common uses are personal and recreational use, then followed by instructional use, so things like flight schools. Other uses include business and personal travel, aerial surveys, agriculture, firefighting, law enforcement, medical transport, and express freight. And the, th the reason why they were allowed that exception is their engines are a bit different. Their engines require really high amounts of octane in order to safely fly, not detonate, not have engine knocking. So by adding the lead in, the planes are in able to safely fly because that octane is being generated. Different planes need different levels of octane, but by adding the lead in, it results in the high emissions of lead from leaded aviation gasoline use, otherwise known as avgas, as you can see in the graph on the right. So how, how big is this problem? There are about 20,000 general aviation airports in the United States. The map on the right shows where the top 100 lead polluting airports are. Darker, larger circles show more lead pollution. But even in areas where you're not seeing a circle, there are general av aviation airports. And if you're somebody in a community living by that airport and or working in that airport, even if the emissions are less, it's still a ex significant exposure. There are about 16 million people in the US that live within one kilometer of one of these airports. About 5.2 million people live within half a kilometer. 363,000 are children ages five or younger. And it's also an environmental justice issue in addition to being a public health issue. Many of these communities near the airports have populations uh, with a higher prevalence of people of color, people with low incomes, and it's also an occupational health and safety issue. There was a study done that found maintenance workers who worked in locations closer to the runway had higher blood lead levels, and also workers who worked longer hours and longer hours closer to the runways were found to have higher blood lead levels. And we know that health effects from lead are profound and permanent. For example, in children, it really harms their development, specifically brain and nerv nervous system development. It can cause irreversible cognitive impairments. And a recent study found IQ points lost to blood lead levels resulted in an estimated cost of about $554 billion. And Majority of that, 74%, was from very small blood lead levels, less than five micrograms per deciliter. Another vulnerable population is pregnant people, miscarriages, stillbirth, premature birth, low birth weight are all effects from lead, that lead that is being passed on to the developing fetus. And when most people think of lead, they think of the effects on children and infants, but it affects adults too. 
It increases the risk for high blood pressure, cardiovascular problems, kidney damage. And a recent study found that lead accounts for many avoidable deaths in the United States each year. For example, just from cardiovascular disease mortality, there is about 256,000 deaths per year. And it's not just mortality, there's morbidities as well. Things like headache, fatigue, abdominal pain really can lessen the quality of life. And there are studies that have been done connecting specifically the lead from Avgas to elevated blood lead levels. For example, a 2011 survey a study found that there was a significant association between potential Avgas exposure, so how close you are to a general aviation airport, and blood lead levels in children in North Carolina. And even after confounding factors were controlled, dose response patterns were seen between blood lead levels and airport distance, with the greatest impact seen within half a kilometer. Another study was from 2023, and this really got national attention and helped in make the community decide that they wanted to, the effects were so bad that they wanted to have the airport eventually closed. This was in Reed Hillview in Santa Clara County, California. They found that children closest to the airport had blood lead level increases that were about 50% of what was seen for children in the Flint, Michigan water crisis. And it might not sound like a lot to some people, but with lead, that is a significant and concerning result. This study also found dose response patterns between blood lead levels and um, airport distance, specifically the greatest at for children at um, half a kilometer and a kilometer distance from one of these airports. And they also found dose response patterns for blood lead levels and aircraft traffic. In terms of some important dates to consider, organizations like Friends of Earth and Earth Justice have been working on this issue for a long time, since the early 2000s. Um, in October 2022, EPA proposed an endangerment finding, which was then finalized this past October. And I know um, later part of this presentation will go more in depth into the regulations. In terms of FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, they have an EGLE initiative, which stands, which stands for Eliminate Aviation Gasoline Lead Emissions. It's a partnership between FAA and the aviation and petroleum industry. They have a non-mandatory goal for a phase out by the end of 2030. Right now, there are two current FAA approved unleaded fuels. There's Swift Fuels UL94, which has a lower 94 octane rating. Some planes are able to use this. And then there's the GAMI 100 UL. This has a higher octane rating of 100. And we're told that all planes um, will be able to use this. And as we learned about all this, one question that really came to our mind is how can we accelerate the transition to unleaded fuels, not relying on a 2030 deadline when this could start progressing sooner, especially since there's so many communities negatively affected. So with that in mind, we came up with this conference, which we held in December 2022, bringing together many different stakeholders to focus on solutions. So we had health experts, aviation experts, members from affected communities, um, unleaded fuel developers from both GAMI and SWIFT, FAA, the Eagle coordinator for FAA at the time. Earth Justice, Friends of Earth, a uh, staff member from Rokana's office, and airport managers and directors who have the unleaded fuel at their airports. And one of the main goals was finding an alignment of interest. One interesting thing we learned was removing the lead from the fuel is not only better for health, but it's also better for engines. It requires the engines to th then have less maintenance, which is a great savings. In addition, we also identified some barriers. One thing was a low level of awareness. When community members are concerned, the job of educating people on lead and its impacts really fall on them. This is also an occupational hazard for airport workers. And many communities 
feel that, you know, the idea of safety for communities and pilots really came up. Many community members felt like their safety wasn't being considered. The concern of having unleaded fuels be safe for pilots was a main talking point, um, which is very valid and important, but community members wanted their health as the people on the ground to also be considered more. There's concern for regrettable substitutions. Are the materials being put into the unleaded fuel safe? Another point that was brought up are the mitigation measures in a National Academies report from 2018. They have suggestions on how to reduce harm from lead as the transition happens. So changing where planes are run up and making sure pre-flight um, pre fueling is safely disposed of and not just put into the soil is are important things that can really help mitigate harm as the transitions made. And in terms of you know putting the fuel directly on the soil even, in addition to the deposition from it coming from the air, many um, community members are concerned, is my soil contaminated? Is my drinking water contaminated? And then they were advocating and asking for testing to be done. So as I wrap up this part of the presentation, here are some main points. One is there's no safe level of lead and lead accumulates. It accumulates in bodies, it accumulates in the environment. So continued use of leaded avgas is a public health concern. It affects workers, it affects communities, it affects vulnerable populations like children and pregnant people. Quick change is needed and the public community, the public health community can help. One is dispelling, dispelling misinformation about lead. We hear a lot of times you don't have to worry about lead unless you're directly ingesting it. And we know that's not true. Um, we hear sometimes that, you know, the small amount of lead is not a problem. We know that's not true. Helping communities advocate and um, promote the science behind lead, it would be very helpful. Also just a general increase of awareness at, for the community at large, but also within the public health community about this source of lead exposure. And advocating with affected communities would be some great strong points that this issue could really use attention. And with that, I will turn it over to Earth Justice who will talk about the regulations and legal implications. Thanks so much, Becky. And I'm hopeful that you'll be able to advance the slides um, for me. Cool. No problem. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for having us here to talk about this um, kind of scary, but I think very interesting topic. Um, we can go to the next slide, please, Becky. Thanks. So Becky laid out in really helpful detail, I think, the problem of leaded abgas. And it can make us feel a little bit powerless, but fortunately, federal law does give EPA a tool to do something about leaded avgas. So the Clean Air Act has this provision. Um, it's section 231 of the Clean Air Act. It says the administrator shall from time to time issue proposed emission standards that are applicable to the emission of air pollutants from aircraft engines. And then this is the important language here which in his judgment causes or contributes to air pollution, which may be reasonably, which, which may reasonably be anticipated to endanger public health or welfare. One would think the number of times I've said this, I would be able to say it without stumbling, but alas, that is not uh, the case for statutory language often. So this, this secondary finding, um, the last three lines of this statutory language that we have on the screen here is called an endangerment finding. And it's the first step to regulation. Once EPA makes this endangerment finding, then EPA and FAA must act. So um, if we could go to the next slide, please. For decades, environmental groups, um, community groups have urged EPA to start regulating leaded avgas by making this endangerment finding. So in 2003, Blue Water Network, which is a was then a division of Friends of the Earth, first requested EPA to make an endangerment finding for leaded abgas, but a couple years later, EPA said no. Then in 2006, Friends of the Earth formally petitioned EPA to make the endangerment finding, and once again, EPA said no. Um, they of officially denied the request in 2012, but in 2010, EPA did something um, 
which I'm not going to get too deeply into unless you're really interested in administrative law, but they basically put out this document that acknowledged that there's no safe level of lead and that about half of domestic lead emissions were from use of leaded avgas. And they, when they did deny the request in 2012, they said that they intended to initiate proceedings with the aim of um, having a proposal for an endangerment finding in 2015. Uh, in 2014, um, following that 2012 denial, Friends of the Earth and others sought reconsideration and EPA said, okay, we plan to issue a proposed endangerment finding in 2017, which seems great. But then I think folks know what happened in 2017. Um, somebody else took office and that somebody else didn't quite seem too keen on doing environmental regulations. And so nothing happened in the Trump administration. Um, next slide, please. So in 2021, um, once we had a new EPA in office and one that has really prioritized uh, lead and getting lead out of various sources, um, Earth Justice on behalf of our clients, Friends of the Earth, Oregon Aviation Watch, I think I see Mickey on this call, which is exciting um, from Oregon Aviation Watch. Alaska Community Action on Toxics and the Center for Environmental Health, alongside a couple of municipalities, petitioned EPA once again to make an endangerment finding. And very excitingly, in 2022, EPA responded and said that it intended to issue a proposed endangerment finding that year, and it actually did it this time. So that was great. In 2022, EPA published the proposed endangerment finding and just a year later, um, in October 2023, EPA made the final endangerment finding. So this is great news, um, but it is really just the start of the regulatory scheme. Uh, next slide, please. So in the endangerment finding, EPA found two things. First, that lead air pollution may reasonably be anticipated to endanger the public health and welfare, which I think should surprise nobody in this audience. Um, and number two, that engine emissions of lead from certain aircraft, these piston engine aircraft that Becky was describing earlier, um, cause or contribute to the air pollution referred to in one. Um, so that's basically just tracking that statutory language that we have below. Uh, next slide, please. So I think just taking a quick step back, I think what's really helpful to remember in this context is that this didn't really just happen in a vacuum. It took decades of advocacy by community groups and by environmental organizations to keep saying to EPA, we need to, we need action on this. And, you know, back in 2010, when EPA put out that document that acknowledged that there was no safe level of lead and that um, leaded outgas does contribute quite extensively to domestic emissions, they did say, you know, well, we just need more information about whether the lead emissions from these aircraft are actually influencing people on the ground. And so, you know, the public health professional community really rose up and um, rose to the occasion and just started publishing research on what an effect this actually has. So Becky did do a very helpful job in describing, I think the first paper that really brought this to light, um, the Miranda paper in 2011, and um, the most recent Sami Zaran paper, but there's a couple of others that I've just put on that slide, um, which I believe will be made available to folks later. But I think this is just like a really great example of how um, public health professionals can really move the needle in regulatory policy um, and really drive agencies to make good decisions. Um, okay, and then so I, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so it's also um, EPA did do a lot of their own research, and this is uh, just what Becky explained earlier. Um, it looked at the communities surrounding those 20,000 general aviation airports, and it found that more than 5 million people live within 500 meters of a runway um, and 50 meters of a helipad. One thing that I think often can get um, lost in this is that helicopters can use uh, leaded avgas as well. 
And there are a lot of children that live or attend schools in very close proximity to general aviation airports. Um, next slide, please. So now what is, I think, a natural question. Um, now that the finding is final, leaded avgas, we think, should be phased out. Um, it triggers the obligation for EPA to issue proposed emission standards, and EPA has to consult with FAA on those emission standards. Um, and then simultaneously, FAA has to set fuel standards to control or eliminate these emissions once EPA has made this endangerment finding. Um, I think, uh, next, next slide, please. Um, our, we think this should happen imminently. Um, it has not. EPA has not proposed their standards yet. Um, they've said generally they're working on it, but there's the time really is now to move away from leaded out gas. And so I think what Becky um, explained earlier, I have a little bit more information just on this slide about the two fuels that have already been approved by FAA that can be used in a lot of piston engine aircraft um, and that don't contain lead. So that lower octane UL-94 can be used in about two thirds of all piston engine aircraft. And then um, the 100 octane G-100 UL is approved for use in all aircrafts in the fleet. And it's expected to be in California, available in California this summer, which is extremely exciting. Um, and there are other companies that expect to be able to bring 100 octane unleaded fuel to the market soon, who are going through FAA, uh, FAA certification right now, which I just said FAA reauthorization, which is a perfect segue to um, Nathan, who is in the policy and legislation team at Earth Justice, and will go over uh, pretty briefly just what is happening kind of outside of the regulatory scheme. Nathan. Thank you, Kelly. And just want to echo um, Kelly's thanks um, and Becky's thanks for, for having us today. I think this is um, one of the, you know, being able to speak with you all on this issue is part of the work as we try and figure out how do we, um, you know, move this transition forward as quickly as possible. Um, so with all the great information that Becky and Kelly have laid out, I just wanted to first kind of go through some of the major stakeholders that we're, you know, both working with and representing uh, and also trying to, um, in some cases, like work against. Um, first and foremost, as I think has been pretty apparent across the presentation so far, um, it's community members, it's impacted individuals. Um, at Earth Justice, we are really, uh, you know, like privilege to get to work with folks who are directly impacted by uh, these emissions. And I think that's, you know, something that as we continue to try and reframe the narrative, or at least, you know, from my perspective here in Washington, DC, something that we really want to be understood is that this is these, these emissions have real impacts and they're um, harming communities as we speak and as, as planes continue to, to fly overhead uh, nearby all of these uh, neighborhoods. Um, you know, also public and environmental health advocates and professionals uh, like folks at Earth Justice, quiet communities, um, of course, local, state and federal public officials, which we'll talk a little bit more about how they've been engaging um, and getting more engaged in a moment, um, state and federal regulatory bodies like Kelly just laid out, um, pilots, airport operators, airport advisory boards. Um, this is a constituency that uh, we, as we continue to get deeper into the, the work, really are understanding as um, while we generally have been, um, you know, working, have had different interests than, than as, you know, pilots and airport operators on, on this front, they are a really, really important stakeholder here because they hold so much sway and they have a really strong presence um, here in Congress, but also at state and local, um, you know, in state and local governments across the country. Um, and so making sure that we can bring them along and get them on board with making this transition happen is, is also really important. Um, fuel producers, distributors, fixed base operators at airports. Um, Kelly was kind of just speaking to this, how, you know, especially some of these companies that are producing these unleaded fuels, also really important to um, kind of get, uh, be engaged with them and, and, and see how we can help, uh, you know, bring these unleaded fuels to market as soon as possible. Um, and then the industry trade associations, which I was kind of referencing with the pilot groups, there's a whole like alphabet soup of these groups who again, have a very strong presence here in Congress. 
um, and as, as we've come to understood it, have historically kind of stood in the way of making progress on this issue. Um, but again, given the strength of their, you know, presence um, at all levels of government, uh, we know that getting them to be supportive and, and to also buy into this transition will be really important. Um, next slide, please, Becky. So with that said, um, Congress is definitely paying attention to this issue. And uh, after that 2021 study that Becky referenced earlier that focused on the um, you know, effects of uh, leaded avgas at Reed Hillview Airport out in Santa Clara County, um, you know, there has been a growing um, kind of like resurgence and uh, attention on this issue here in Washington, D.C., um, so in the summer of 2022, uh, Representative Ro Khanna from California held uh, an oversight subcommittee hearing. Uh, he chairs the Subcommittee on Environment, um, where they looked uh, kind of like did a deep dive into leaded aviation gasoline. Um, it actually was very well received by both parties, because I think when you lay out the facts, it's hard to dispute that this is clearly a, you know, kind of ridiculous issue that we still have and have not addressed. Um, and so that kind of brought the, the, the issue back to Congress in a new way. Um, currently, and since last, last year, um, the FAA reauthorization has been moving through um, Congress. This happens every five years. Um, they kind of like reassess and, and, and re-infuse the FAA with uh, funds and, and their kind of programmatic directives. Um, again, thinking about those industry trade groups and some of these uh, you know stakeholders who have stood in the way of progress on this issue, um, with all the positive developments that we have seen in the past few years on this issue, um, these some of these groups have already been involved in then trying to include provisions that would protect the legacy of low lead fuel, um, entrench you know leaded fuel at airports even further, uh, and something that, as we have started to get more involved again at the federal level with our advocacy on this issue. Um, we have been working with a broad set of, uh, of, of other stakeholders, impacted community groups and organizations to try and push back on to ensure that um, what Congress is passing is not actually making it harder for us to transition. Um, unfortunately, speaking of harder to transition, uh, late last year, Alaska Senators Murkowski and Sullivan introduced a Congressional Review Act uh, resolution to repeal the, the endangerment finding that Kelly uh, just took us on a little deep dive on. Um, they, you know, again, this endangerment finding, as Kelly explained, doesn't tangibly change or, or impose any sort of standards um, on, on airports, um, on, on plane engines, um, but that's a direction that we're trying to move towards. But even before, like, that standard setting process, we already have um, some, you know, these Alaska senators who um, want to try and defend uh, uh, low lead and make sure that low lead is uh, available long term uh, up in up in Alaska and, and, and by extension across the country. Um, so we're actively working to uh, fight that Congressional Review Act resolution um, and think that ultimately we will, you know, be successful in making sure that that doesn't move forward. But I just wanted to include it here to, to give folks a sense that this is an active issue, and it's one that, again, when we make some progress, industry and their allies immediately push back. Um, but we have a growing list of members of Congress here who uh, are paying attention, who have made this a priority, who who are engaged on this issue and want to do more. Uh, and as kind of a lead in 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 the, in the current landscape of things, Representative Zoe Lofgren, um, who represents the district. Uh, where the Reed Hillview Airport is is located, which has again received a lot of national attention because of the level of exposure from that that community members there face. She led a uh, letter with 44 other members of uh, of the House of Representatives calling on EPA and FAA to move forward with the standard setting process uh, again that Kelly laid out. Um, so we have some folks who are fighting against us, but we have a growing list of folks who are also fighting with us, which is definitely encouraging. Next slide, please, Becky. Um, and this is also not happening in a vacuum here in DC. Uh, at every level of government, more and more gov more and more uh, public officials are starting to take note uh, and be responsive to what they're hearing from from communities across the country. Um, so there have been multiple statewide efforts to ban the state uh, the sale of leaded avgas. Most recently, just introduced last week, is a California statewide wide ban, who's been introduced by a state senator there. 
um, which was definitely exciting to see. And I know that a lot of the California partners that we work with are excited to, to uh, support that bill and see if they can pass it in the state of California. Um, the previous year, both in Washington and in New Mexico State, uh, there were bans introduced by uh, members of the state legislature there. Um, the Washington State bill ended up being watered down into something else that I know the representative who introduced it was um, not completely pleased with and is actively working um, to, uh, you know, try and get more, more work, uh, more legislation passed there. Um, and then also local municipalities and airports are increasingly starting to, to take more proactive measures. So um, Santa Clara County with Reed Hillview Airport, they moved to ban the sale of leaded app gas in 2022. Um, there are a few airports and, and local uh, uh, authorities that have created uh, app gas, unleaded app gas subsidies, uh, for example, in Naples, Florida, and in Long Beach, California. Uh, and then also some airports are starting to set out plans for how they plan to phase out the use of leaded ab gas, uh, even advance a, in advance of the 2030 timeline that uh, Becky referenced uh, from, from the Eagle Initiative and, and what is being relied on at the federal government. Um, so again, this is just a, a quick snippet into some of the work that is being proactively done on this issue at various levels of government. I think that's the end of my slides, if I'm not mistaken. Great. Um, yeah, so I will leave it there. I think, Becky, I'll turn it back to you. Sure, and I'll I'll go through this slide, but then invite Jamie to jump in and add it some suggestions as well. But you know, we we appreciate everyone's time today and for listening to our presentation, and we just hope that it was helpful. And you know, this is a very intense problem, but there's also a lot of opportunities for progress and solutions. So. We have some suggestions here for maybe how the public health community can help support some of those positive changes. And we we hope to, you know, see more positive news in this issue soon. Yeah, thank you, Becky. Um, I'll just... Um say a couple things because I know we're kind of uh, running short of time here and there's some other things that uh, need to be discussed and we'd also like to take any questions. Um, there, It's a little confusing because what Becky said, what, what Nathan um, referred to as well is that there are these fuel alternatives on the market today. So one question is, well, so why isn't it being used? The problems, it's it's more complex, like, like most things. Um, scaling up the manufacture of these products, getting companies interested in scaling it up when it's really a small market is one thing. Setting up proper distribution uh, channels to transport uh, the fuel to these small airports that are you know all over the country and widely distributed um, is another. There's every airport's different in terms of the sort of fuel storage infrastructure and dispensing infrastructure that it has. Some is perfectly sufficient for taking on a new fuel alternative. In other cases, they don't have storage capabilities and may need funding uh, to set up new infrastructure. And then at least in the short term, the fuel is quite a bit more expensive. Um, you know, one would think that if you can afford a plane, you can certainly afford to pay another uh, dollar or so for fuel. But, you know, of course, that's uh, not universally true. Um, and there's uh, some concern about that as well. So uh, some of the things we're thinking about is how do we remove those stumbling blocks through proper incentives? And we're, you know, working and thinking on that. So that can help smooth the way to accelerating this. Um, but getting back to how the public health community can help, at least, you know, we provided some examples. We'd love to hear your thoughts um, about this as well. And uh, maybe we can follow up um, at another time if we need to move on. Great. Well, we can, I think we can stop sharing the slides, um, but I want to give a heartfelt thanks to Jamie, Becky, Kelly, and Nathan for a super informative, uh, very clear diplomatic, shall I say, presentations. 
Um, and really give a shout out to you for letting us know that this is a real way that public health professionals have helped move the needle. It feels very empowering in this time when sometimes it's hard to feel empowered. Um, so thanks for um, jumping in on some of those questions. There was the one in the chat. There's another one about engine changes. Maybe we can also respond to that in the chat. And I'd like to just pass the baton to you, Raquel, if you want to take us through this section business. Um, but of course, if we, people have lingering questions about these excellent presentations, please put those in the chat so they can be addressed there. And I think we will be able to share out the slides uh, when our fearless leader, Natalie, returns. So thanks again for those great presentations, Raquel. Thanks for having us.